Hello, my name is Christine Go. I've worked as a language teacher, language learning researcher, and a language teacher educator for over 30 years now. My interest is in second language listening and speaking, learner metacognition, teacher cognition, and education for the future. I have shared my ideas and research on different platforms through journal papers, publication, book publications, book chapters, as well as through invited presentations at conferences, panel discussions, and also workshops. And it has always been a wonderful experience for me to share with language educators and teachers around the world on teaching second language listening and speaking. Today I would like to share with you this topic on second language listening, harnessing learners' metacognition to help them listen. Why have I chosen this topic? We know that language education is a very important part of the education of many children and youths around the world today. And we also know that listening is an important language communication skill. But more than that, listening is also a means by which our children, our youths who are learning a second language acquire and develop their second language. However, listening has not always received the attention that it deserves in many language classrooms. Some teachers feel that given time, students will be able to acquire and become better at listening. And we know that this is not always true. So language activities are also used in the classroom to help learners practice more of their listening and practice doing more tasks related to listening. And at the same time, we also know that some listening activities are actually a disguised form of testing listening comprehension. So it is important for us as teachers, as language teachers, to think about how we can actually teach our language learners second language listening so that they can learn the skills, the strategies, the processes that are needed to facilitate good listening comprehension. So in this presentation today, I'm going to put forward the view that we must teach listening in explicit ways in order to facilitate our language learners learning of listening. And to do this, we must make listening visible. Listening is, a lot of the time, is invisible to other people. Sometimes it's also not visible or not or to, to language learners themselves. They may not be conscious of the way they listen. So one important point I want to highlight throughout this presentation is learners' metacognition, or their awareness about the way they think, about the way they learn, and about the way they listen. And to address this title for my talk today, I'm going to address three questions. And these are, what is listen why is listening important to language learners? And what factors affect their listening proficiency? What is learner metacognition? And why should we harness it to help learners develop listening proficiency? And last but not least, how can we apply a metacognitive approach to teaching second language listening? Let me start with the first question. Why is listening important to language learners and what factors affect their listening proficiency? Listening and speaking are critical to second language acquisition and development. Based on a number of second language acquisition theories, we have reason to believe 
that listening comprehension is able to facilitate learners in acquiring the language, which includes the vocabulary, the grammar, the use of that language through repeated interaction with input that is comprehensible. In other words, input that they can make sense of. And sometimes the input could be a little bit more than they understand, but through working with the input through other ways, such as through listening strategies, they can be, uh, make this input more comprehensible. And this in itself will help them in the acquisition process of a second language. Speaking is also important, and in fact, listening and speaking are two sides of a coin. Comprehensible output in speaking is also important. This refers to getting learners to rephrase the things that they are saying so that it makes sense to them and it also makes sense to the listeners. Through the process of listening to their listeners, uh, to, their to people they're speaking with, and when they, un when they realize that the listeners may not understand what they say, they repeat or they rephrase what they say. And so in this interactive process, learners will be pushed to produce comprehensible output. So both comprehensible input and compre comprehensible output can play a very important role in helping second language learners acquire and also develop their listening. But I'm going to focus on listening today. Now I would like to um, show a systems model of second language listening. And this is to show the complexities of second language listening and it also helps us think about the many factors that will affect our language learners in their listening comprehension. In the box right at the top, you will see a number of person factors. These refer to individual differences for learners, and this refers to the understanding of the language, how much they understand the language, as well as the cognition, how they make use of their mental processes to make sense of what they hear, and how they make use of their metacognitive processes to step back and use strategies and other processes to help them understand what they hear. And these are just some examples that I have listed here. There are also effective processes, their anxiety, their sense of self-efficacy, as well as their motivation to listen. These are all individual factors that can affect second language listening. But apart from individual differences, there are also many factors in the listening environment, and these are referred to as the listening context. It could be the specific environment in which they listen, um, whether it is formal, informal listening, whether they are just listening to a lecture, or whether they have to interact, and so on. The tasks are also critical because different tasks have different levels of difficulties, different levels of challenge and ease, and all these can affect how learners listen and how well they comprehend what they hear. And of course, speakers, as well as the, um, the text itself, also present different uh, challenges or ways of facilitating second language listening comprehension. And all these are um, channeled through an interactive process where strategies are used, where social interactions are key in some situations in order to help learners produce certain outcomes. And these outcomes could be quantitative, as in outcomes we measure through a listening test, but more often than not, the outcomes are qualitative in nature. Whether or not second language learners have a positive experience about their listening, about their interaction, will depend a lot on these strategic processes that are affected by all the different factors. And in the same way, whether they feel motivated to continue 
to listen or to learn to listen in another language, whether they feel they want to engage further, whether they feel that they uh, have the confidence to speak now with more speakers um, or first language speakers of, of that language they're learning. All these will be affected by myriad factors as we have seen here, as well as through the strategic, cognitive and social processes that they engage in. So let me quickly just talk about some of these processes. Very briefly, we can distinguish the cognitive processes in listening into top-down and bottom-up. As you can see, top-down processes refer to the use of stored knowledge and concepts that an individual has. And these stored knowledge and concepts will help inform what somebody hears. Usually, top-down processes are helpful in helping learners make sense of what they hear when they can't hear everything. It also allows them to elaborate on an interpretation of a message that they have heard. Sometimes the interpretation could be quite limited, but by drawing on their stored knowledge or schema, we can see that learners are able to make sense of what they hear. So the interpretation is not perfect, but hopefully it is a reasonable interpretation that will help them to continue to communicate. Now at the same time, another process that is in interaction with top-down process is bottom-up process. And these sometimes are referred to as decoding processes. These are the abilities to work out the sounds that they hear and make sense of the sounds that they hear and identify words and phrases that they hear. So bottom-up, top-down processes both interact in order to facilitate language learning and in this case language uh, listening in a second language. And this all these processes can also be presented in another way, that is through the interactive phases of language comprehension in, uh, or discussed in psychology. So in terms of listening, we can see that um, the top-down, bottom-up processes all come into play in these three processes. Perceptual processing refers to the ability to recognize acoustic signals as meanings, in other words, as words that they know, as sounds that are meaningful to them. Passing is the ability to transform the perceived uh, sounds into me mental representations. Then this means that the learner needs to draw on their understanding of the grammar of the language in order to know how the different parts of the acoustic signals actually come together to present meaning. Without understanding or some knowledge of the grammar of the language, passing is going to be very, very difficult. The third process refers to the use of top-down, mainly top-down processes, in something called utilization phase of language comprehension. And this refers to interpreting and responding to a message or storing the message that has been um, interpreted. So in this phase, the learner would make use of what they have heard, what they have understood through passing, and then make use of their um, top-down knowledge or their schema in order to make sense, uh, interpret what they hear. Now these are interactive processes. They tend not to be linear, although it can be in some very, very challenging situations where learners need to pause and uh, have the luxury of pausing in order to interpret a message. But in real-time listening, these processes take place um, simultaneously because the input comes at the language learner concurrently with the, time, with the processes that they are working out in their minds. So because of this, we find that there are often challenges and problems that learners face. 
So in an in a early study that I um, carried out among second language learners, I identified a number of problems that learners encountered. And you can see that they are all related to the three phases of language comprehension. The perception phase, the passing phase, as well as the utilization phase. And as I said earlier, because these three processes tend to either co-occur or, or overlap, right? Uh, it, these problems will create a bigger problem for language learners when they are listening to input, especially when they are engaged in listening that is in real time and where the input is not just one sentence but a complete discourse of many utterances. And sometimes it could also be many speakers participating in that discourse. So let me come now to the second question. What is learner metacognition and why should we harness it to help learners develop listening proficiency? In other words, what can learner metacognition do to help learners learn to listen better? And how can teachers use and harness learners' metacognition to do this? So I will start by answering this question, but the second part of metacognition will be addressed through the third question. So let's look at, first of all, how listening has been taught, and then I will explain the place of metacognition. So second language or foreign language listening has been taught for more than half a century. And it has been taught using different approaches and different methods. In the early days of uh, listening instruction, we find what is called a text or comprehension oriented approach. What this means is that learners listen to a text that is spoken or recorded. And very often, these texts are actually written texts. Written meant to be read. However, if we look at some of the materials that were used during this time in the 50s and the 60s and even right down to the 70s sometimes, many of these passages were not meant for listening. They were meant for reading. Well, in spite of all this, learners are asked to listen and then answer comprehension questions to indicate their understanding. And immediately, I think we see the problem there. This is a text or comprehension oriented approach to listening. Learners do, you know, are able to practice their listening through these uh, activities. But the question is, how are they learning to listen? Are they being tested on listening? Or are they being taught how to listen? Now, in the 70s, we saw something called the social linguistic revolution in um, and the understanding of language use and all these understandings have um, an impact on language education. So during this time we have the communicative language teaching methodology in many parts of the world and what this means is that language is taught for communication regardless of whether they're listening, speaking, reading, writing, it must have a communicative purpose. Now this is a time when listening was taught as part of communication and this is great, a great beginning for the teaching, the real teaching of listening and learning of listening. So authentic materials that are used in um, outside the classroom are brought into the classroom to help learners listen to these different sources of input which they would have to listen to if they were outside the language classroom. And learners were also encouraged to uh, interact with one another in group discussions, in pair work, so as to practice and improve their listening and speaking skills. So this is the beginning of an emphasis on teaching listening for a real purpose which is for communication. 
and for different forms of communication, whether it is in an academic situation, in a social situation, and a host of other situations. Now, in the late 80s, and especially in the early 1990s, we saw another great development in language teaching. And this is the time when language educators go back or went back to the heart of language education, which is the learner. And this is the beginning of the learner-oriented approach, where learners are taught skills, processes, and strategies to manage and facilitate their own language learning. And in the same way, we see this in um, listening right until today. So, I want to focus now on learner-oriented approach. In the learner-oriented approach, what takes place is that we are really focused on the language learner's own thinking, own experience about the language learning process. In listening, this is particularly important because listening tends to be invisible. We ask our students to listen to something in the classroom, we look at their faces, but as language teachers, we have very little idea about what goes on in their mind as they listen. So metacognition as a construct, as a concept, lends itself very well to helping us improve teaching and learning for second language listening. It is a means by which students can learn how to listen and think about how they learn. Learning to listen means for us as language teachers, making listening processes visible to the language learners. Just as when language learners do reading and writing, they can see the output, they can see the input, and they interact and they work on this input and output in order to improve in the next composition that they submit or in the next reading comprehension passage that they work with. By listening, this has been rarely the case. So in order to help us learners learn to listen, we must make listening visible, as, or as visible as we can possibly make it. Now metacognition as a term, as a name, or a concept, um, was put forward by John Flavel. He used the term metacognition to refer to knowledge and cognition about cognitive phenomenon. And very often we use the shorthand of thinking about thinking or thinking about learning. So what is metacognition? According to Flavel, and I read, I am engaging in metacognition if I notice that I have more trouble learning A and B if it strikes me that I should double-check C before accepting it as a fact, if it occurs to me that I had better scrutinize each and every alternative in a multiple-choice type task uh, situation, and before deciding which is the best, and if I sense that I had better make a note of D because I may forget it. So all these uh, behaviors and, and mental processes, noticing, um, something striking us as unique or important, if suddenly something occurs to us, we become aware of it, we sense it, all these are part and parcel of our metacognitive uh, experiences. Metacognition, and Flavel carries on to say that it refers, among other things, to active monitoring and consequent regulation and orchestration of these processes in relation to the cognitive objects of, or data on which they bear, usually in the service of some concrete goal or objective. So for us, the concrete goal and objective is, in this case, better listening proficiency or better comprehension of a particular text that the learners are exposed to. So I have adopted the construct of metacognition for language learning 
in my work for speaking and listening. So this diagram presents the three aspects of metacognition, the knowledge, the experience, and the strategy based on uh, the work of Flavel. So very quickly, metacognitive knowledge refers to three kinds of knowledge, person knowledge, task knowledge, and strategy knowledge. And for listening, this refers to, and these are real examples that I had taken from language learners when they reflected or introspected on their metacognitive knowledge. Self-concepts and self-efficacy. Learners may say, I know themselves, I'm an anxious listener. If I try harder, I can improve, right? If that's their way of um, thinking of how to improve. And they are also aware of the specific problems and uh, the causes and also possible solutions. Um, the second bullet point is, uh, is the word psycho is a term used quite often in uh, Singapore, which means that if I make myself think in a certain way, so I can psycho myself, talk, and comfort myself to get rid of negative feelings. Task knowledge. Learners are also aware of the mental, affective, and social processes involved in listening. They may not know everything, but they have some inkling of how some of these processes inform or influence their listening. And they also have some ideas about the skills that they need to use. So for example, you need to know how some difficult words sound when they are spoken. And this speaks to pronunciation and speaking that's closely linked to listening. They also know factors that influence their listening. They also know ways of improving listening outside of classroom. In terms of strategy knowledge, learners are able to tell us about the strategies that can facilitate comprehension and manage learning, um, things or strategies that are appropriate for tasks, and also some of them are able to think about strategies that are not effective. Now all these examples I've given you were taken from a large number of students' um, reflections. So what it means is that no one student is able to um, share or, or, or possess all these different aspects of metacognitive knowledge. And this in itself is a teaching point for us as language teachers and educators. And that is we need to harness the collective understanding of the students in our classroom about second language listening because there is so much there together they can share with one another and help one another understand the processes of listening better so how do we make the learning of l2 listening visible so what i've shown you earlier about metacognitive knowledge is about the understanding of the processes involved in um, listening. And um, strategies that are used are also an important part of uh, making listening visible. So the answer to this question, a simple answer, is that we need to include metacognitive engagement in the classroom when we are teaching listening by drawing on the learners' metacognitive knowledge, by teaching them strategies that are useful for managing listening difficulties, for facilitating comprehension, and also by helping them to be aware of their metacognitive experience. In other words, we want our students to step back a bit and examine their own listening. And using the learners' own metacognition, we are able to facilitate better teaching and learning processes for second language listening. So this takes me to the third question. How can we apply a metacognitive approach to teaching second language listening? And I'd like to start by uh, proposing this idea of metacognitive instruction in L2 listening. And by this, I refer to pedagogical procedures that enable learners to increase their awareness about the listening process 
while at the same time develop effective skills for self-appraising and self-regulating. Listening comprehension and the overall progress of the listening development. So this means it's not just for a task, a single task, but metacognitive instruction is also important to help learners take a long-term view of their second language listening development. Metacognitive instruction brings cognitive, affective, and social learning processes to conscious level so that language learners can become better at self-regulating and self-appraising their language learning efforts. And for teachers, what this means is that metacognition provides insights into our students' individual learning needs, preferences, and goals. We may not have the time sometimes to really drill down into some of the learners' needs, especially for those of us who have huge classes. Some classes can be as big as 40, but I know in some countries, some classes can be as large as 70 or even 80 in a classroom. So how do we have a learner-oriented approach? And one way is to make use of the um, resources, the activities that can harness learners' metacognition so that language learning does not depend on the teacher who is standing in front or is walking around the class, but the learning, especially learning of listening, will also be personally meaningful to them as they reflect on their own listening and learn how to learn new strategies, new ways of improving their listening. So I would like to propose two ways in which we can do this. Task-based listening lessons with metacognitive activities on the one hand, and on the other, a metacognitive pedagogical sequence. And I will explain each one. But these two are examples that my colleague uh, Larry Vandergrift and I put forward many years ago of how we can harness learners' metacognition to improve the teaching and learning of second language listening. Let me start with the first. A task-based lesson or a sequence of lessons where we include metacognitive activities. Now for many language teachers, this is a sequence that we are familiar with, especially those of us who are familiar with the communicative language teaching methodology. Listening is done in a classroom, but we also provide scaffolding for listening. So for example, we have a pre-listening stage where language learners are asked to think about the listening uh, text or the video text that they are going to um, see or watch or listen to. And in the pre-listening stage, we often help learners think about how they can prepare themselves better for listening. And this involves the, the planning of maybe content words that they think they will encounter, the things they think speakers would say. But a metacognitive approach would also include planning of strategies that language learners will need if they encounter certain difficulties during the listening or the viewing stage. So they are prepared beforehand. The strategies are activated in their mind so that if they experience certain problems, and we know there are lots of problems as I've shown you earlier, they are able to manage these problems better and not get stuck in the listening input and aren't able to progress. Now the post-listening phase is also very important. In many language classrooms, the post-listening phase is the time in which um, the input that has been processed is used in another task. So for example, a teacher may say, okay, now that we have watched this video, write a summary. Okay, so part of the, the purpose for that is to get students to practice their writing, to do more writing. Now that's fine and that's a very good integrated approach to language teaching. But if I were to focus just on listening, I would say make use of this post-listening phase 
to review not just the task but also to evaluate how they have listened during the listening or the viewing stage. And this is also a time when students can share with one another their understanding of the difficulties they've had, the, the, the processes that they have experienced, and they can benefit from a teacher-guided discussion. In other words, in the post-listening phase, how much a student actually um, has understood is secondary. How many correct answers in a task is a secondary consideration. The primary consideration is for us to focus on the, 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 the learner's experience through um, metacognitive awareness, through increasing the metacognitive awareness of what happened. And during this time, there are many teaching and learning points about second language listening, what the problems were, how they could have managed it better, and also in terms of planning, what do, you, what, what do they think they will need to do the next time when they encounter a similar kind of listening task, right? And for language learners, they can also monitor how they have been um, listening throughout the different um, you know, tasks or activities they've had. And finally, extensive listening can also be tagged on as an important component of a listening lesson. Now, we know that in extensive listening, we ask students to listen to you know, things beyond the language classrooms. But in these different extensive listening activities, we can also include metacognitive reflections, metacognitive planning, evaluation, and also group work in order to help them, help our students listen and learn to listen better. So the goal is of course to try and have more exposure to the language, but at the same time it is also um, self-directed and guided by the, the prompts or the uh, questions that we provide them with. So in a nutshell, the three, these three phases are very important in m many language classrooms now. We don't just listen, we have pre-listening to plan and to prepare and we also have post-listening. And this is when we can also use these post-listening, uh, pre-listening and post-listening to build up the, not just the top-down processes but also the bottom-up um, skills in recognizing words in recognizing words that they may know in writing, but they may not uh, recognize when these words are spoken. So the next uh, method is a metacognitive pedagogical sequence. And this, in this sequence, what we see is that listening is repeated, not once, not twice, but more than that. Now we find that in many listening lessons, Students are asked <coughs> to do a pre-listening stage and then they're asked to listen. Say, usually what we would say to students is, um, listen to this once just to get a sense of everything that you hear. And then we play it again and the second time we will ask our students to focus on the task at hand. Now, this is different from the kind of repeated listening that I have just mentioned. In this sequence, we start with the pre-listening, which is the planning and predicting. What do you think you're going to hear? What are the words you think uh, will be said by the different speakers? Um, and at this stage, it is perfectly fine if students uh, were to say, would give you a word in their native language, and we can translate it and put it on the board, or put it on the screen for them. And at the same time, we have different verification stages. We get the students to listen to something once, and this is when they monitor, evaluate, and also check their prediction with their peers. And they listen again, and this time they verify what they have heard. And remember, at this time, they haven't seen any written form of the input. So what they have heard, as well as the, um, the, the inferences, the strategies that they have used, and again, they uh, come together and if two, two, two students in a group say, you know, you know that part, I don't know what that word is, I can't make out what that word is, they can try and problem solve and say, 
Well, let's, let's, let's try and guess what that word might mean or might be, right? And the third verification is when they listen to the same thing again, and this is when they can continue to monitor the understanding and solve their problems, and at the same time, this is also when we can help them with uh, verifying as teachers, we verify some of the things that they have understood and where, when they had problems, this is also the time when we can get them into the next phase and that is to reflect and evaluate how they have listened. And importantly is that we encourage learners to set their goals for the next listening lesson. So what I've shared with you here are two ways in which metacognitive instruction or a metacognitive approach to, to listening instruction can be carried out. And this is by making use of a tried and tested task-based teaching sequence, as well as something that is pre uh, presented here as a metacognitive pedagogical sequence that repeats listening. And in each listening, learners engage with the text in different ways and engage with one another in order to understand, the understand, uh, to understand better and to verify the understanding. And finally, to do this with the help of the teacher. Okay, so let me sum up this part about metacognition and learning to listen. Metacognition allows us to think about our thing. It's a human cognitive ability and applied to language learning and specifically to second language listening, we ask students to notice and examine their own listening. We also provide them with the processes and the scaffolds to orchestrate and regulate their own listening by using strategies and by engaging in processes that they have now become familiar with. And last but not least, Metacognition allows learners the space, both curriculum time as well as the mental and the emotional space to reflect and evaluate their own listening performance. Now, this approach of using metacognition brings a new dimension into teaching and learning listening. And I hope that you will find these suggestions here useful for your consideration as you think about your own listening instruction in the language classroom. So a summary, these are some of the key points. L2 listening is important for language acquisition and development and involves complex interactions of skills, processes and outcomes. Listening processes are largely hidden from the naked eye. Teachers must make the learning of L2 listening visible to improve learner agency. Learners can actually do a lot to help their own learning and we need to provide the scaffold. Metacognition supports and develops learning and this is something that is well recognized in the literature on, educational, uh, on education and psychology for learning. For teachers, we can plan special metacognitive lesson sequences and adapt special or everyday listening lessons to incorporate metacognitive activities. And finally, these two points, teachers must recognize the difference between practice, testing and learning listening. And last but not least, we and our learners need to recognize that L2 listening takes time and explicit teaching will help learners improve their listening. So many of the ideas I've shared with you are from some of the books and um, articles that I've published. So thank you very much.